I apologize that my Portuguese is limited, <laughs> but I begin thus. I could also say bonjour, shalom, salam alaikum. And as I always say, since I'm from Jamaica, how you keep it? And I hope you keep it fine. I'm talking to you today about a series of concepts that I hope will be useful to you. The title is Shifting the Geography of Reason. And so I will talk about geography, and I'll talk about reason. But I'm going to talk about much more. Now when we say geography, you see geo, which is earth, graph. You put a map on the land. And when you create a graph of the earth, the earth you reorient you see it in a different way. Well, we human beings have been doing that since we began. And my talk will bring up beginnings and changes. But to understand this, I first will point out that I often talk about what it means to be human, what it means to be human facing our freedom, and what it means to question our ability to do that, and also to question what is questioning itself. Now, the shifting ge the geography of reason is the motto of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. And the Caribbean is a very important place in the story, just as South America is a very important place in the story. Because this is a story about the complexity of empire, colonization, and conquest. Now, when we say empire, we often don't understand that although there have been many empires, all empires have a certain form. Every empire always come about and announce it is the last empire. Remember, Rome was to be eternal. Empires are expressions of the human desire to be God. And when empires are formed, they bring things into them. Remember the expression, all roads lead to Rome. And in fact, there are many reasons why empires, whether they're Babylonian, Kemetan, which is the correct name for Egypt. Egypt is a Greek word. The people were Kemetans. But when the Egyptian Empire came, they took this African world and called a city, Memphis, Egypt, and called the place Egypt. But then, as we know, there were others. There was the Holy Roman Empire. There were the Caliphates. And as all of these came about, they bring to their centers all the ways they organize life and they consume. Because as we know, gods are hungry. And when gods consume, eventually, as we know, resources die. Now, although there have been many empires, different empires may emerge with different logics. And we know this because, for instance, Roman empires, for, as an example, were about roads and technologies of engineering. But there were empires based on books and conceptions of God. The British Empire was based upon the seas. In fact, the British Empire attempted to control the world in such a way that the sun, as they said, never set on the British Empire. 
And we know what happens when empires change to hegemonies. When people become imperial, of course, as we said, they're to be eternal. We know what that means. See, I live in the United States. And in the United States, what many Americans believe, and it's always funny to me to hear this, they believe that if the U.S. empire falls, you know what that will be? America, the U.S. believe it's the end of the world. <laughs> now, of course, since we're in Brazil, could you imagine how the Portuguese think when they look at Americans thinking their empire means the end of the world? The truth is, when empires fall, people live on. And some don't even realize they're not an empire anymore. The British, for instance, think they're still an empire. But when empires fall, they never just fall, they leave tracks. And in every empire is a way of organizing life that other generations change. The Roman Empire led to European towns and cities. We don't even realize right now, but we're in the middle of a revolutionary change. Because you see, the, US, the British Empire wanted to spread communication across the globe. And it's no accident that the American Empire generated the internet. It's no accident, in fact, that we live in a world that is so interconnected, so packed with 8 billion people, with communication so different, that if we don't get a response in one second, we think that it's too long. <laughs> and that means something is happening to us. So I'm going to tell some stories about what happens when this shift occurs. Now, although there have been different empires, they don't, as I said, do the same thing. You see, although there were other empires, a unique empire began in the Caribbean and in Central and South America. To understand this, I'm going to tell a series of stories. The first story was what happened when Christendom, because there wasn't a Europe before, there was a Christendom that was in conflict with an Afro-Arabic world in North Africa. And that conflict spilled over into the Atlantic and landed on the shores of the Bahamas. And in that moment, something new occurred. Because you see, in Christendom, real people were Christians. And in fact, they understood the world as a world of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And Muslims and Jews were under the concept Raza. But when they landed in the Caribbean, they met people who were not only not Muslim, not Jewish, not Christian, but not like the non-Jews, non-Christians, non-Muslims they met before. And this led to a question, what are we? I call this the anthropological question. And this anthropological question was a question that began to change everybody. Because you see, the Caribs, the Tainos, the people, of what we call today the Americas, they also met these Christians 
And their world and time also changed. You see, we tend to tend tell these stories one way. The conqueror coming in, and as though the people disappear whom they conquered. But you see, that is because we still work with a bad metaphysics, a bad conception of reality. The bad conception of reality is one in which we think of ourselves as little gods. And you know if you're a god, you don't need anybody else. You're self-contained. You're a thing. But a human being is not a thing. A human being is a relationship. And so if a human being meets another human being, another human being is also meeting that human being. And so a relationship occurs that shifts both groups. This shift meant that not only Christians were changed, not only Tainos, Karaks, Arawaks were changed, but it also meant time was changed. You see, we forget that when the Spaniards and the Caribs met, they met in a new time. They met in the time in which their worlds changed. And in that changed world was an opportunity for a genuinely different kind of world, except for one thing. The problem was that a world came with the hope of an empire. And that meant to deny that it was changing. Now, I cannot speak as long as I would like, so I'm going to move through this change in a way that will tell this story more quickly. Although other empires emerged, this one had the concept of Raza. And Raza, as we know, became race. And race asked the question, what is man? What is human? But it asked it in a way of trying to say who is not man, not human. So many people began to find that their world was being produced by a geography of reason imposed on them that was trying to take away their humanity. That geography of reason began to produce sciences. It produced anthropology, sociology, economics, psychology. It produced eventually political science. It even produced those that were even against it. Gender studies, race studies. It began to create a whole world that is based on what some people are not. Now, the reason I said we should think relationally is that the people on whom this was being done were not people who stopped thinking. We have a myth, for instance, that tries to treat people as if when they are colonized, their brains stop. But what these people did throughout was to fight, to argue, to think, and in this part of the world, while this is going on, they were talking with and struggling with people like Las Casas, Suarez, Perez. And as we know in the Las Casas Sepulveda debates, which led eventually to the Atlantic slave trade and Africans being brought over, that debate was a debate 
about what is a human being. So we have already a shift. The primary question of the modern world was why was it a Euro-modern world? In fact, that debate created Europe. But Europe could not exist except as a creation in relation to Africa, Asia, South America, North America. This production of geographies were actually creating new kinds of beings. And as these new kinds of beings emerge, some of them realize that the creation was a concept we know as coloniality. Now, this colonizing concept was a concept that began to produce as well kinds of beings. And so if we're going to offer a critique of it, we often try to work within it and reason with it. But here's where it gets tricky. We heard about Frantz Fanon earlier. And Frantz Fanon was a black man from these parts. In fact, the very question of the modern, the Euro-modern world came from the Caribbean, Central, and South America. And what Fanon noticed was this. Fanon looked at how that world saw itself. It saw itself as a party of reason. Many of you know that world. You could imagine, imagine it as a good disco. The music is playing. The lights are flashing. And then you see the party. There is Immanuel Kant. There's Hegel. There's Marx. And you know where Friedrich Nietzsche is? He's at the bar. <laughs> As the party is going, everybody is there. Hegel is trying to be dialectical. We see Marx trying to be material. And then Frantz Fanon walks in, and suddenly the music stops. And Fanon looks, what, what? And Fanon wrote, he noticed when he walked in, reason walked out. The geography of reason is like a map that says real reason is in the north, it is white, and it gets even trickier. Because before we even get to this problem with Fanon, there's also a unique gender side of it. Because you see, as the modern world pushed coloniality, it also pushed a form of power to control even reason. And so if you look at the logic, and I don't have time to go into detail, but it has in it a kind of rationality. The rationality says that everything must be made in an order that controls it as consistent. And so if you think logically, each step of rationality must be brought in line with all the steps. That means it must be maximally consistent. It must obey its rules. But now you have a problem. Because as we know, the regulation, that legal order, that epistemological or knowledge order, would like the human being to be with it as well. But I always ask audiences, if you had a chance, would you like to be married to, in love, or date 
a maximally consistent person? Now that is hell, isn't it? Because you see, if a person wants you to be maximally consistent and obedient to rules, that person becomes unreasonable. And now we have the problem. Reason and rationality are not identical. In fact, what many of you who are parents in the room, what many of you who are not parents will learn when you have children, is that part of becoming an adult, part of growing into reason, is not only knowing how to obey rules, but it's knowing when to break them. And this now is perhaps one of the reasons we struggle with the conception of reason as feminine. You notice in French, it's la raison. So picture black man Fanon coming to la raison and she flees. She runs away. If he tries to catch her, it is violence, rape. What is he to do? It gets even more tricky when you look at the logic of the sciences. Have you noticed that we always talk about fathers of disciplines? The father of psychology, the father of sociology, the father of... Why do we talk about fathers? Can women create disciplines? But that's because we have in it this heterosexual structure of reproduction that says the rational man meets the feminine reason and produce a child called discipline. It gets tricky then even more when black men produce disciplines. Everyone who studies sociology knows that Marx, Durkheim, and Weber are called the fathers of sociology. And if you do jurisprudence, whether it's Kalsvitz or law, you know, whether you look through heart, they're all these men. But everybody knows the way sociology is really practiced. W. B. Du Bois, a black man, did a lot around changing the very idea of how we do sociology, even the methods of ethnographic research. So why isn't Du Bois a father of sociology? Well, it's because that woman that's called reason was changed in Euro modernity into a white woman. So they have to imagine the discipline produced through mixture. But even worse, they want to have white fathers. So you could imagine a world that says to you, if there's something you could be certain of, it's not good to have a black daddy. So Du Bois comes up and looks at social science and says, who's your daddy? And they don't want it to be black daddy. But even more, what Fanon realized was there is a problem in this model. See, if reason leaves, if he forces her, that is violence. So he, paradoxically, has to reason with reason, reasonably. Now we have an important shift because, you see, she, we have to show why she does not have to be a white woman. La raison. In fact, now we have to ask, how do we produce disciplines that's a shift at the level of gender, race, geography, power, class, all of these. We have to think differently. 
So I'm going to now move, because we can talk in questions, a little more into the implication of this. The first one Fanon noticed, and what many of us in the Caribbean Philosophical Association, and many of us now realize, is that maybe the problem is not in simply what we reach for, in this case reason, but how we reach for it. In other words, perhaps colonization was not only about what, but how. He raised the problem of colonization at methodological levels. And so when we met, many of us, when we created the Caribbean Philosophical Association, it was funny, the first thing we were asked when we met in Barbados, and then we decided we had to meet across languages. We met in Puerto Rico, we met in Francophone, we connect to Papiamento, we go to different parts of Africa, we meet in South America, we meet in Australia. The first thing we were asked was, when are we going to meet in the United States? And our answer is, when people from the United States will come to meet with us. And at first people thought it was arrogant, but they didn't understand we were saying something different. And this is the part I want to lead to now. You see, when you shift the geography of reason, the orientation, you take seriously that as a relationship, shifting relationships produce new relationships. And so, we realize there's something missing in the global south. If you look at the way ideas are approached and presumed with the global south, it's already based on the geography of up and down. In ancient Kemet, Lower Egypt was actually south. Upper Egypt, I'm sorry, Upper Egypt was south, sorry, Upper was south, Lower was north. In the ancient world, people thought east-west, but they didn't look at up-down as what we look at as Europe today. But there's something even more that we need to think about. As we begin to think about it, the very concepts we use in those maps, in our ideas, are already locked in a model based upon disciplines as theological or godlike. And so, if the discipline is theological or godlike, then the methods are like having the words of God. This leads to a decadence because we turn away from reality and look inside the disciplines and we forget that they were produced for a relationship with reality. This means that if we're going to shift our orientation, shift the geography of reason, it may be new relationships to produce new and different kinds of knowledge. And so, as this shift occurs, we may have to go beyond our disciplines to develop a relationship with reality that could address a shifting understanding of the geography and reason of the South. Now, what would this be? First thing, first thing to bear in mind when you make this shift in the way you do production is that it means you turn and change the meaning of the concepts universal and particular. The old model said Europe, category white, were universal. 
and anything of color south was particular. The problem is if the first one treats itself as a god, it turns away from reality. If the second one admits it's not a god, it is in relationship with reality. So what this means then is it addresses the contradictions of the old model. And in addressing the contradictions, raise the question of what can we do beyond those contradictions. Some people think that means that the other model becomes the universal. But that doesn't work either. Because it now must address its own contradictions. I call that the meta critique of reason. It is not only asking can reason be reasonable, it is also asking how do we justify even justification? And it's clear we cannot use the old logic of trying to force it to obey our rules. We must learn to adjust and transform who we are in relationship to reality. It means then that shifting the geography of reason is also shifting the geography of the human being. In fact, it means that there are other kinds of human beings to come, but they may not come with the premise that we came from, because our premise was coloniality. You see? Whereas our relationship to them is a different question. The first was a question of closeness, to be closed and complete. But if we have a relationship of open, then theirs is premise on the question of freedom. Now, we live at the moment in an epic battle between two forces of right-wing politics. The first is neoconservatism that wants to push us back to the 18th and 17th centuries. The second is neoliberalism and it wants to push us back to the 19th century because the 20th was the century of revolution. But many of us don't realize that in the 21st century, we face the question of how we relate to the 22nd century. And it's not a question of globalism versus not globalism. There could be another way, which is what is it when we already have the globe humanity does, but we don't, we have not cultivated the conditions for open human relationships. The conception of the human being as open is a different anthropology. In fact, it questions what is a human being. And so I close with a third shift. You see, when we shift the question of reason, when we shift the question of knowledge, we also shift the question of value. And here is the problem. The old model says value only comes from the north, Value only comes from that which is white, and value only comes from that which is male. However, if I am 
right, that shift in the geography of reason is also a shift in relationships and a shift in value. Now we have a new question. Can we also shift how we value? And one of the fundamental problems in the global south is that although we give a critique of the North, we continue the practice of mimicry. If you look at Elbury University in the Global South, many associations, many political organizations, they always start with how to imitate a Northern one. In South Africa, the universities are trying to be like Harvard, Oxford, Stellenbosch, um, France, Germany. In parts of here, it's whether it's Portugal or Spain. In India, they're trying to be English and so forth. But those are all orders of knowledge based on empires. We live in a different world. We live in a world where empires have become so greedy that they can't even sustain themselves for a long time. Remember I said that God consumes? Empires used to last 1,000 years, 2,000. Now a long empire is lucky to get through a century. But when we shift the geography of reason and we shift the geography of value, we have a new question. It's not only do we now create new ways of thinking, new ways of organizing ideas, new institutions that are indigenous to our social realities, but it means we must also value those who produce it. A big problem in the global south is not just valuing each other, valuing ideas from South America, from India, from Africa, from Australia, from other parts of Southeast Asia, but it is also value being valued by each other. Do you see the difference? When you value being valued by each other, you, complete, you turn the world around. When I think about many of our ancestors, when you think about the indigenous peoples of this continent, when you think about the enslaved Africans, when you think about, and people don't know this, enslaved people who are of what became Europe, when we think about those in Asia, what we forget is that many of them, in their struggle not just to survive, but to build alternatives, also gave us a gift. And that gift is the relationship we have to them if we value that they value us so much to create the conditions for our survival. So if in valuing, being valued by each other, we develop those relationships, it will change how we can learn from each other. It opens up a world of knowledge, a world of value that can actually expand, transform, and set a new condition through which when we say and we ask, what are we? We also have a better question of our responsibility and agency around what we can become. Thank you. Okay,